Oh, Lord, help us never lose the amazement over what he's done for us. That's a sign you need revival. It's a sign you need God to do something in your life. When you lose the amazement over the fact that he saved you in the first place. Amen. Thank you, young people, for that beautiful song. Matthew chapter 3 is where we will be this morning. I have about four messages crammed into one. Somebody came up to me after church last week and said, one of these days we're going to have a service and let you preach till you get done. I said, I don't know if y'all can handle that or not. Might have to have a seventh inning stretch in there somewhere. Man. Uh, we were talking about just the blessing of preaching the Word of God and especially preaching here. I love preaching at Calvary. I love the liberty to preach here. And during the Jubilee, Brother Buster Mullins and Brother Chad Watson were supposed to close out on the, that Wednesday night, and they were going back and forth. Well, Brother Schiffer, won't you just get Brother Mullins to preach? Just let him preach, and I won't preach, and just let him turn loose and preach. And Brother Mullins, I know, oh, let Brother Mullins, let Brother Watson preach, and let, and let him preach, and I'll just sit back. And, and they said, well, won't you, let, won't you let him go first? And if he gets plugged in, then just let him preach. I said, getting plugged in ain't the problem. It's getting unplugged. That's the hard part. <laughs> Amen. I love preaching here. I've got, a, I've got a, about three or four pages of notes, but I'm not going to worry about the notes. I'm just going to follow the Lord. If I don't get finished, I don't get finished. All right? It is what it is. Matthew chapter 3. You should be there by now. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Matthew. Stand with me, please. Verse number one, if you're there, say amen. amen. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went, he, uh, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance. And Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than me, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning. Try to follow your leadership. Thank you for the singing, and Lord, thank you for what you've done in our hearts already, but bless the preaching of your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The verses that we've just read is a little bit about the ministry of a man the Bible calls John the Baptist. John the Baptist. In John chapter 1, verse number 6, the Bible says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And he was not the Christ, but he came to bear witness of Christ and was a vital part in preparing the way for Jesus before Jesus came on the scene in his earthly ministry. In fact, John the Baptist was asked in John chapter number one, verse 19, they said, who art thou? And he confessed, and he said, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I'm not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. And they said unto him, who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That was the ministry of John the Baptist. His ministry was very specific, and it was actually a very short amount of time. His ministry was around about six months or so. From the time he came on the scene to the time that he was murdered, he was killed, had his head cut off. 
His ministry involved preaching and preparing the way of, for Jesus Christ. And his coming and his, 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 uh, his was prophesied all the way back in Isaiah chapter 40. We may get there in a little bit. But I was thinking about John the Baptist, thinking about uh, his ministry and how unique it was. When you look at his ministry and his life, as contrasted with a lot of preachers today, men of God today. John the Baptist was not concerned about fame. That's very clear when you read the verses. He was preaching in the wilderness, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. He was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. In fact, if they wanted to hear him, they had to come out of the city to where he was to hear him preach. He wasn't concerned about fame. He wasn't concerned about fun. Preaching on repentance was probably not a very fun message back then. No more fun than it is preaching today. Just in these verses, I circled in my Bible the word repent, verse number two. He said, repent ye, verse number two. In verse number eight, bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance, verse number 11. I baptize you with water under repentance. I'm working on a message to preach here very soon on a Sunday morning. On biblical repentance is one of the most misunderstood, yeah. distorted, yeah. Yeah. and ignored doctrines in the Bible. Yes, but John the Baptist's message pretty much was a message of repentance. He wasn't in it for the fun or he wouldn't have preached repentance. In fact, Herod killed him for his message. Right. He wasn't in it for the food. Unlike a lot of gluttons we have in the pulpits today, he ate locust and wild honey. Is everybody okay? You preach against cigarettes and beer and people get say amen. You start preaching against gluttony and it gets real quiet in your average Baptist church. I don't know where that came from. His meat, the Bible says in verse four, was locust and wild honey. He wasn't in it for the food. He wasn't in it for the fine clothes. The Bible says he wore a camel's hair and had a leather girdle about his loins. He wasn't concerned about the fellowship because every time the Pharisees and Sadducees showed up, he called them a bunch of vipers and snakes. <laughs> Definitely wasn't trying to get in. He wasn't trying to get in the clique. He wasn't trying to be accepted by the brethren. He wasn't trying to get invited to the next big conference or the next big, big meeting. He wasn't, he wasn't lobbying for a higher position. When he got around all the big dogs, he called them out. He wasn't concerned about friends. He definitely wasn't in the ministry to make friends with everybody. He didn't care if he was the only one preaching repentance and he didn't care that he was preaching in the wilderness. So what did he care about? Well, he cared about fruit, according to verse number eight. Bring forth therefore fruits. Meet for repentance. But as I began to study and look at the life of John, I kept noticing this word that kept popping up. Interestingly enough, this story, these verses about the ministry of John the Baptist are in all four Gospels. They're in Matthew chapter 3, it's in Mark chapter 1 verse 3, it's in Luke chapter 3, and in John chapter number 1. All four Gospels give us a similar account of the ministry of John the Baptist, and all of them has the same thing that they say. And that's where he said, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And I had to come to the conclusion after studying my Bible that God likes it straight. And that's what I want to preach on for just a few minutes this morning. God likes it straight. Is everybody still with me? Now, I don't know how far I'm going to get in this message. God's always liked it straight. He's always insisted on it being straight. In Isaiah chapter number 40, here's what he said. Uh, in verse number three, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough place is plain. God likes it straight. Three things I want to give you by way of introduction. First of all, God likes straight paths. God likes straight paths. 
Our verse in Isaiah 40, verse four, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight. In Isaiah 42, verse 16, he said, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse number eight, the way of peace they know not, and there's no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. God likes straight paths. In every one of these gospels, the Bible says, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So God likes straight paths. We ought to like straight paths. Number two, God likes straight preaching. He likes straight preaching. In 2 Timothy chapter two, verse number 15, Paul's writing to Timothy, and here's what he said. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you look that verse up in your Greek concordance or your Strong's concordance or your lexicon, you will find that the two English words rightly dividing is one Greek word that literally means to cut straight to proceed on straight paths, to hold a straight course, to make straight and smooth, to teach the truth directly and correctly. Paul told Timothy, when you preach, preach straight. Rightly divide the word of truth. We got people that when they read their Bible and they discern their Bible or they preach the Bible or they teach the Bible, they deviate from the truth. We're going to get into this in just a second. They don't cut straight lines. We say with preaching without fear and without favor. Do you realize for a preacher to stand up in the pulpit on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night and to preach straight Bible, they have got to ignore the people that are sitting in front of them. You cannot, you cannot customize your message depending on who's sitting in front of you. I know preachers that won't preach on certain things when certain people are in their church because they don't want to offend them. They don't want to hurt their feelings. If there's somebody in the church that gives a lot of money, they won't deal with their sin because they're afraid they're going to stop writing the checks. Somebody in their church is living a certain way. They won't deal with their sin or preach to them, afraid that they will offend them and they'll leave. That's not preaching straight. That's not rightly dividing. When you take the Bible and as you're preaching, you avoid certain subjects and you dodge certain concepts and you skip over certain truths. That's not rightly dividing the word of truth. And now here it is in 2023 where it's unpopular to preach on just about anything. Just about anything. Uh, the big news headline was the new Speaker of the House. Don't know much about him. Did a little bit of research. I like what I saw, but we'll see. Time will tell. But I saw this net headline that says that, that this new Speaker said he refuses to apologize for his beliefs and his positions. And I thought, well, when's the last time somebody confronted a liberal or a socialist or a Marxist or an atheist or an evolutionist and demanded they apologize for their position. Why is it that people that believe the Bible are the only ones that are ever expected to back down from what they believe? You can believe everybody came from a monkey. You can believe men can get pregnant. You can believe eight and 19 year old kids have the right to cut their privates off. And that's perfectly okay. But if you say, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, everybody all of a sudden wants you to apologize and back down. We're talking about in 20, is everybody okay? 2023, where it's not popular to rightly divide the word of truth. But God likes it straight. Amen. 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 One preacher said, if it rubs your cat the wrong way, turn the cat around. Amen. That's what the Bible says, rightly divide the word of truth. Isaiah chapter 28, verse nine and 10, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, rightly dividing the word of truth, preaching it straight. 
What God wants is what God demands. In Nehemiah chapter number eight, verse number four, we find the story where Ezra the scribe, the Bible says, stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. It's a lot of things we do in our churches. You say, well, it's just tradition. Well, maybe, but a lot of it's based in the Bible. And Ezra stood up on a pulpit made of wood and opened up the book, the Bible says, in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. So why do we stand up when the preacher reads his text? Well, they did it in the Bible. They stood up for the reading of the word of God. Amen. At least we let you sit down for the preaching part. I know some preachers that make you stand the whole message. Brother Sammy wouldn't think nothing about making you stand for 45 minutes. I've stood many times while he was preaching. You're away from him to say, and you may be seated. He never did. He just preached. But I guarantee you there was a whole lot less people going to sleep while he was preaching. That's a long time to stand up. They stand up for nine innings at a baseball game during the World Series. Stand up during the football game and beat on the side and holler and scream, stand up. But they stood up, the Bible says in verse number six, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen, with lifting up their hands. Why do people say amen in church? They did it in the Bible when the preacher was preaching. They said amen, amen. That means let it be so. I told you there's about four messages in here. Lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So they read the law and then he explained it to them so they would know exactly what it was that God was trying to say. God likes straight preaching. I hate leaving a service and say, I wonder what that preacher was trying to say. Preach for 45 minutes and you leave scratching your head. I want to be able to say one of these days when I'm, when I'm laying in my casket, I want somebody to walk by and look in my casket. You know what I want them to say? He's moving. <laughs> no, that's not what I was going to say. When they walk by my casket, I want them to say, when that man preached, you had no problem knowing and understanding what he was trying to say. You didn't leave saying, I wonder what he was, I don't want to camouflage and mask the truth of the word of God in riddles. Just what did, what did God say? He, they gave the meaning distinctly. I have heard preachers before, they preached for 45 minutes and didn't say one blessed thing. Politicians can do the same thing. And ask them a direct question, they'll give you a 10 minute answer and never answer your question. God is a God of plain, straight preaching. God likes straight preaching because it expounds doctrine, it establishes direction, it eliminates differences, it encourages dedication, it exposes disobedience, and it enforces discipline. <laughs> God likes straight preaching because it reproves our wicked heart, it redirects our wandering heart, it refreshes our withering heart, and it rekindles our waning heart. God likes straight preaching because it reveals to us the ways of God, reminds us of the word of God, removes off of us the wrath of God, and reinforces to us the will of God. God likes straight preaching. And that's why he had somebody like John the Baptist go before him. Somebody that wouldn't back down. Somebody that wouldn't compromise. Somebody that when the pressure got turned up, wouldn't falter and wither under the pressure. It was John the Baptist that looked at Herod and said, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Ain't too many preachers would have done that. Huh? They'd have learned a more tactful They'd have learned a more diplomatic, a more political approach. He was, he was like old Nathan the prophet, wasn't he? He just stuck his bony finger in his face and said, you're not right with God. Straight preaching. God, number three, likes straight people. Because I believe with all my heart it's going to take straight preaching to produce straight people. Yes, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 15, here's what Paul said. That you may be blameless and harmless. Watch this. 
the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights on the world. God wants straight people. The unsaved world is a crooked people. Can I get a witness? Somebody said the other day, said a, a verbal agreement is not worth the paper it's written on. But a, y'all get that? Some of you blondes are going, I don't get it. <laughs> can I tell you something? You can have a legal document notarized and written up by a law firm and have it, and have it gone over with a fine tooth comb and sign your name to it and you can still get out of it. That's the day and age we live in. I remember reading about a day when all you had to do was shake somebody's hand. Look them in the eye and you could buy a piece of property, you could buy a house, buy a car on a handshake. Get a line of credit on a handshake. Walk into the bank and shake the banker's hand and do business and transact on just a handshake. Now, we live in a crooked, crooked. Most of them in, 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 in Congress are lawyers. You about have to have a law degree to figure out how to be a politician without going to jail. All right. Amen. Amen. amen, Brother Johnny, say amen. amen. Hey, lawyers are the, are the, are the best criminals because they know how to not get caught. Yes. Go into public office, come on y'all. Yeah. They go into public office and make $150,000, $200,000 a year and in just a couple of years they're millionaires. Multi-millionaires. Crooked as a, as a snake. Some of them are so crooked that when it comes time to bury them, we're going to have to screw them into the ground. <laughs> crooked, perverse nation. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 13, 14, and 15, who leave the paths of uprightness. Who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. Whose ways are crooked. And they're froward in their paths. God called them crooked. They're crooked in their dealings. They're crooked in their doings. They're crooked in their deliberations. They will sit around behind closed doors at conference tables and they will cook up ways to be crooked. Now, you can call me a cynic if you want to, but I've lost confidence in anything and everything and everybody except God and the Bible. I, 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 don't, hey, I don't trust nobody. Just this week, is everybody okay? Just this week, I've had two of my church members say, I got better when I quit taking my medicine. They said, the medicine was killing me. I said, you think? Everybody's talking about, well, we, if we give enough money, they'll find a cure for cancer. They're not going to cure cancer. They're making too much money off of cancer. Do you know how many people it would put out of work if they found a cure for cancer? They make you sick and then they sell you the drugs to treat it. Until they get every dime out of you and then they bury you. Start all over. Crooked. Crooked. If you think your government is concerned about your well-being, you, I, got, I got a bridge I want to sell you right after church. I'll give you a good deal on it. Government don't care about you. These corporations don't care about you. These pharmaceutical companies don't care about you. I hate to break, some of y'all, some of you are going to be heartbroken. Pfizer don't care whether you live or die. They don't care. We live in a crooked and perverse nation and God likes his people, his children to be straight. So they'll stand out in a crooked day. They're crooked in their declarations, everything they say, everything comes out of their mouth as a lie. You'd be shocked at how many Christians think that Israel bombed a hospital in the Gaza Strip. Are you kidding me? Everybody knows what happened. Yeah. It was done by terrorists. Right. They didn't even bomb the hospital, they bombed the parking lot. Right. But you let the news anchors get a hold of it. Yeah. Anything they can do to paint the nation of Israel as a bunch of baby killers and murderers. You say, preacher, what's your point? My point is, we live in a crooked and perverse nation yeah. and God wants his people to be straight. Right. Not go along with it. 
God wants us to be different. If we're going to be different from a crooked and perverse people, we've got to be straight people. Straight in our doings. Straight in our dealings. Pay your bills. You go in somewhere and buy something, pay for it. I don't care if it's a pack of gum or if it's a car. Pay for it. Pay your bills. I'm talking about straight. Pay your bills. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this is, looks on some of y'all's faces. It's cracking me up. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25. Let thine eyes look right on. And let thine eyelids look straight before thee. This is Proverbs chapter, this is Proverbs chapter number four. I love these verses. Verse 25 and 26 and 27. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. What is he saying? I want you to walk straight. I want you to walk a straight path. I want you to be straight people. Not all over the place, all over the map. Steadfast, unmovable. Amen. Why did God place so much emphasis on John's message of making the path straight. Let me give you a couple of points. That was introduction. Number one, God likes a straight because when it's straight, the resistance is removed. He likes it when the resistance is removed. Now stay with me. We're going somewhere with this. Prepare ye the way of the Lord's, what he said in Matthew chapter three, verse number four. And there is an enormous amount of of preparation and work that is involved in making his path straight. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 said this, God wants a highway. <laughs> I read the verse, did y'all not hear it? Isaiah 40, here's what he said. Here's what he said. Prepare you the way of the Lord. I mean, Isaiah 40, verse 3, prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway. For our God, a highway in the desert. I looked it up. When we think about highway, we think about the interstate or the beltway. That's what we think about, or a four-lane highway. Grace and I went down to uh, Jen's daddy's funeral down in Southern Maryland last week, week four last, whenever it was, and a GPS took me interstate the whole way, bumper to bumper. It was, it was unbelievable. Saturday. Middle of the day, it's crazy. So Grace, I said, man, this is, I hate this road. But when I left there to come back home, my GPS took me up these little country winding roads with beautiful barns and silos and fields. And I was like, man, the leaves were changing. I said, now this is what I'm talking about. Grace said, I like the interstate. I said, I like this. <laughs> I like looking at pretty stuff. But the roads was like this. <laughs> it was. Still got home quicker. He said, I want, you to make a, I want you to make a highway, in a highway, a desert, a highway. That word highway, I looked it up, it literally means a raised road. It means a road that's been built up. Can I say it? The high road. Huh? That takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of preparation. That takes a lot of planning. Making a straight road, making a highway in the desert, it involves, first of all, your destination. Where are you going? Where are we going with this thing? I was reading about the railroad companies back in the, in the day when they were trying to make that trans, uh, transcontinental railroad and, and, and trying to figure out where it was going to be. One started on the west coast and went east, one on the east coast went west and they had a contest trying to motivate them to get that railroad laid. And they had to figure out where they was going to meet. Course must be charted. He said, I want, I want a, a highway in the desert. I want everybody to know, first of all, where they're going. Right. It involves a destination. It involves deliberation. What's the best way to get there? The most direct route's the best way. They say the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. 
It involves a destination. It involves deliberation. It involves determination. The challenges that you have to face to bring forth fruit. Paul, John, John said, John said, I want to see fruit. And in order to have fruit, we got to have a straight path. How much planning goes into making a straight path, preparing the seed for the soil, preparing the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6 talks about the preparation, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, preparing the hearts of the people to receive the truth, preparing people for eternity, preparing young people for life, preparing God's people for Christian service, preparing the church to reach the world. There's a whole lot of preparation that goes into it. There's a destination, there's deliberation, there's determination, and there's devastation. Devastation. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's got to be pulled out of the way. But the railroad companies was using, they was using dynamite and hydroglycerin. Is that right? Yeah. Nitroglycerin. I knew it was one of those drugs from Pfizer. I just didn't know which one it was. Nitro glycerin, that liquid that had to be kept real cool and you couldn't jar it too much or blow everybody to kingdom come. You know what that was for? Come on, y'all. That was to get rid of all the stuff that was in the way. What did God tell Jeremiah in chapter number one? I want you to pull down, pull up, overthrow, uproot. Then you can build and plant. Yeah. Whole lot of demolition. Is everybody still with me? I know you young people know this. You want to know why rivers and streams and creeks are crooked? Because water follows the path of least resistance. So water's going down the mountain and it gets to a rock, it just goes around it. It gets to a tree, it goes around it. It gets to another little lit, it goes around. It follows. So here's what, here's what God said. God said, I'm not like that. When I get to something that don't like what we're doing, we just get rid of it. We move that. It don't move us. Huh? Make my path straight. Make my path straight. I don't care if there's a mountain range. I don't care if there's a canyon. You got to build a, a, a bridge over it. I want my path straight. And that means there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that's got to be moved out of the way. That's going to resist what I'm trying to do. What was it that was it? Was it Stephen said, why do you always resist the Holy Ghost? God's trying to work. God's trying to move and you're fighting it and you're bowing up. God says, if my path's going to be straight, we've got to get rid of some stuff. We see the resistance that's removed. Number two, we see the route that is revealing. I love this about a straight road. When we went out west, when I preached out there in Idaho and Utah, it was a lost long stretches of road. It's beautiful. You know, like about a straight path, number one, you can see where you are. You can see where you are. Now this is deep, stay with me. Here's what he said in, here's what he said in James that chapter number one. He said his word is like a looking glass, like a mirror. If you need to be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like it to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Beholdeth himself and goeth his way. Straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, the Bible says, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. I love the fact that when you're dealing with God, you know where you are. You also, you can see where you're going. Amen. Yeah. It's a straight, straight road. You can see where you're going. The Bible tells us where we're going. Our, God's goal for us is to be conformed to the image of his son. That's our goal. That's, 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 the, that's the direction we're headed in as Christians. You can also see where you've been when you're on a straight road. Huh? I love that. The route that is revealing. When you're on a, because when you're on the world's roads, the Bible says they know not at what they stumble. They have no idea where they are, where they're going, or where they've been. Their roads look like this. We used to say crooked as a snake. That's a southern statement. Crooked as a snake. Well, you know who the snake is in the Bible, don't you? It's a devil. But thirdly, I'm hurrying. We see the relationship that is rewarding. The relationship that is rewarding. Turn with me quickly back over to Isaiah 40. Let's wrap this up. Isaiah chapter 40. 
I want to show you this. Isaiah chapter number 40. And here, here, here's the punchline. You ready? If you want to walk with God, you got to walk a straight path. Right. <clears throat> You're not going to walk a crooked path and walk with God. That crooked path is not of God. Amen. Amen. It's not of God. Right. You want to walk with God? Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. You want to walk with God? You've got to walk in a straight line with God on a straight path. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Well, let's, let's back up to verse 4. I left out verse 4. Every valley shall be exalted. And every mountain and hill shall be made low. That, that's kind of went with the first point. He's going to bring the mountains down. He's going to bring the valleys up. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough places plain. That's that resistance that's removed. So you can see where you're going. See what he's doing. And then look at what he said in verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall sit together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Verse 7. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let's keep reading. Verse number 9. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say it unto the cities of Judah, behold your God, behold the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead them that are with young. We should have the time to go over to Corinthians where it said, come out from among them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Be a father unto you. The relationship that you have with God when you get on his path and get off of the devil's crooked path, it's well worth it. There may be somebody here this morning, you're on the crooked path. You don't know where you are. You don't know where you're going. You don't know where you've been. But can I tell you something this morning? God wants you to get on his path. He told John, he said, before I get there, I want you to make my path straight. Make the path straight. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, musicians are coming. There may be somebody here sitting in the service this morning, says, Pastor Shifflett, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I don't have that confidence and that assurance that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with God when I die. And I would like for you to remember me in prayer. Would you be honest enough this morning to just quietly slip your hand up where I can see it right where you're at. Just slip your hand up, put it right back down. Preacher, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die. Please pray for me. Anybody anywhere? Anybody anywhere? Just slip your hand up where I can see it. You can put it right back down. Anybody? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure. There may be somebody here this morning say, Preacher, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. No question in my mind that I'm saved. But I'm not where I ought to be with God. There's some things in my life I need God to help me with. I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody, anywhere? Hands are going up. Hands are going up. Hands are going up. Hands are going up. God bless you. Hands are going up all over the building. The altar's full, but there's room for more. If you raised your hand, would you come? If you raised your hand this morning, would you come? As we stand at our feet all over the building. I'm going to ask you to just stand, just bow your heads and pray right where you're at. Folks need prayer this morning. Would you just talk to God? If you raised your hand, would you come? If you need somebody to pray with you, if you need somebody to talk to you, you just let us know. We've got personal workers standing all around the sanctuary this morning. If you're watching online, there's a phone number on the screen. If you'll text that number and say, I need to talk to somebody, somebody will call you after church in just a few minutes with the Bible and see if we can help you over the phone. It'd be our greatest honor to help you this morning.